Hello students and thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul and this is my first video on Love's Labor's Lost. In this video I'll be leading you through a close reading of a few sections, important sections of the play. Um, it's mostly designed for you to follow along in your own text and take notes. Of course, feel free to pause whenever you, you uh, uh, need to take some extra notes or if you want to rewind, uh, but mostly just follow along and take notes on your own and think through the ideas that I'm trying to present here. Use them as the basis for your own further uh, interpretation of the text, both the text that we're reading and the rest of the play. Let's begin with the King of Navarre in Act 1, Scene 1. Let fame that all hunt after in their lives live registered upon our brazen tombs, and then grace us in the disgrace of death. When, spite of cormorant devouring time, the endeavor of this present breath may buy that honor which shall bait his scythe's keen edge and make us heirs of all eternity. Essentially, what the king is saying here is that fame their renown, the legacy they leave behind for the great deeds that they do right now, that they do today, that fame will make them immortal. That fame will last beyond their deaths and will take them into a form of eternity. Even though they may have died on this world, what we do today lives beyond us. That's the essential idea that he's saying. What we do now will make us famous. So it's a bold statement. And it's also a hopeful statement. So we can think about some of the big issues that it raises. The idea of life and death, right? The problem that we are all going to die and that we know that we're going to die. The great problem of the human experience. The desire for immortality, the desire to live beyond our present breath, uh, yet the knowledge that we can't. And the incessant striving in our lives, in various ways, in our work, in what we do, in the art that we create, in the children that we create, that we procreate, we are trying to beat death. We are trying to get beyond death and looking for some form of immortality. But we're always facing the problem, the enemy of time. And that's a, an essential problem that all humans face. What concrete images does the king use in his language? What concrete images uh, express these ideas? Well, let's look at them. Um, hunting, tombs, Cormorant devouring time, that is a bird, cormorant, present breath, the scythe, and an heir, to be an heir to eternity. So think about each of those concrete images and what is associated with them. Hunting, the idea of pursuing fame, the idea of something that all people do, that, that this is a pursuit, that we're always chasing after something that we can never quite reach. Um, and hunting will be a literal action that we'll see later in the play. Um, and it's also metaphorical in the sense of pursuing what all, were all the various characters hunting after. What are they pursuing and who is being pursued by whom? Um, we might also think about the conventional sexual use of hunting as a metaphor. Um, with the woman conventionally as the animal being hunted by the male hunter. Um, that's a very common trope and something that we'll see coming up in this play again and again, uh, the violent uh, eroticism of hunting. Tombs, of course, associated with death, but registered upon our brazen tombs. Um, one, the tombs are brazen, meaning that they are brass or, or um, uh, they are permanent, but also brazen in the sense of being bold, being arrogant almost, being shameless. So the tombs are a shameless, uh, bold statement against death. They are the way that the king and his peers will conquer death, even in their own death. Um, but what's written upon the tombs is what's going to last beyond them. 
So that idea of written word, the written word being something that lasts. And this is compared to their present breath, the breath of life, the breath of the spoken word. Just as this play is concerned with the relationship between words and the things they represent, it's also concerned with the written word as a representative of the oral, the spoken word. And that present breath is the breath of endeavor, the labor, the breath of the laboring man, but also, of course, the breath that they of their words, the breath of what they speak and do. Um, and that, again, as I said, is contrasted with the registered words that are written in stone, carved in stone, literally, on the tombstones of the king and his peers when they die. Uh, but this present breath will last somehow by making itself permanent. And that exhalation of breath is in contrast to the inhalation or the consumption of time, the way the bird, the cormorant, consumes time, devours it. It has an unceasing appetite. No matter how much it eats, it will always eat more. Uh, so it's a kind of perverse parallel also to the idea of hunting. The hunter is pursuing something he can never quite catch. Uh, the cormorant is devouring time and will always keep devouring it. So that idea of, of uh, something, a desire that cannot be fulfilled is expressed in both of those. And this play is very much about desire. And as we'll see in the end, even though it's a comedy, it's also a comedy in which, in which um, the comic ending, the desired comic resolution or fulfillment is withheld from us. And the idea that their breath, their current breath, will make them heirs of all eternity. Uh, so they are breathing now, they are alive, they are in some sense fathering themselves because they become the heirs of eternity. They become the children of eternity who inherit the eternal life of their own fame. So they become their own fathers in a certain sense. They, they reproduce themselves through their actions, which will live beyond them in fame, in eternity, despite their death. And of course, this is a play about love. This is a comedy. This is a play about romance. So it's also about heirs and inheritance and reproducing. So we have a contrast then set up at the beginning between the king and this exclusively male masculine pursuit of fame and the heterosexual pursuit of reproductive uh, eternity through children. Let's move on. Therefore, brave conquerors, for so you are that war against your own affections and the huge army of the world's desires. Our late edicts shall strongly stand in force. Navarre shall be the wonder of the world. Our court shall be a little academe, still and contemplative in living art. You three, Baron, Dumaine, and Longueville, have sworn for three years' term to live with me, my fellow scholars, and to keep those statutes that are recorded in this schedule here. Your oaths are passed, and now subscribe your names that his own hand may strike his honor down that violates the smallest branch herein. Fairly straightforward in terms of what the king's saying, right? He's saying that we're all going to sign this agreement that we've made, that we're going to stay here for three years to study. You three friends of mine, you've sworn to live with me and we're just going to be scholars for the next three years. So now sign, subscribe your names, to the edict that we've passed. Very simple. What's more interesting, or at least more complex, what, what makes the, the edict interesting, is the way that they describe why they're doing it, or why the king describes why, and, and the nature of their activity. He describes it as a conquest. They're conquering their own affections and the world's desires. So this contemplative period is in contrast to the desires, the passions, that is the animal passions, that pull us one way or another in our daily life. The world's desires for wealth, for women, 
um, for good food and luxury, right? Instead, they're pursuing a higher order, fame, something that's going to live beyond them, and they're going to do that through studying philosophy, essentially, um, studying the great works of the past. And that violent imagery of conquest, of the battle against their own inner affections, is repeated when the king explains why they have to sign. They've already spoken, they've already made oaths that they're going to live with him for three years and study and be in this little academe, this little academy, this little university. But they have to write their names down now. Again, that difference between the spoken, the breathed word and the written word. They have to subscribe their names so that their own hand will strike their honor down, that they will turn their hands against themselves, that is their handwriting. If they violate something, in the edict now they've got proof that they've subscribed to it so it proves that they're they've they're turning themselves they're turning their name against themselves essentially so it's uh, again this idea that the written word has a kind of power a permanence that the spoken word doesn't and this may seem obvious to us but think about in a culture that is largely illiterate or preliterate um, now there's a conversion going on, more people becoming literate, the written word and written records, legal records, financial records, becoming more important. And so the idea that your oath, what you say is, has a certain less uh, vitality, less power perhaps, and is being supplanted by the written word, written by, for many people, a strange technology. How do you convert something that's spoken into uh, obscure marking on a piece of paper it doesn't make sense if you are not literate it's a strange sort of magic so this really gets at even though it seems sort of obvious to us it gets at a kind of cultural anxiety about the power of the written word versus the spoken word i'll skip over longueville and Dumaine's um, speeches except to say notice the contrast that both of them play upon, the contrast between the mind and the body, the contrast between higher spiritual, intellectual things and worldly things. And they speak about it. Uh, Longueville uses imagery of famine, of starvation, of fasting. The mind is banqueting, but the body is fasting. And Dumaine speaks about it as a kind of living death, a deadness to the world's pleasures, but being alive in mind, in spirit in intellect. And then we come to Barone. I can but say their protestation over. So much, dear liege, I have already sworn, that is, to live and study here three years. But there are other strict observances, as not to see a woman in that term, which I hope well is not enrolled there, and one day in a week to touch no food, and but one meal on every day beside, to which I hope is not enrolled there, and then to sleep but three hours in the night, and not to be seen to wink of all the day, when I was wont to think no harm all night, and make a dark night too of half the day, which I hope well is not enrolled there. Oh, these are barren tasks, too hard to keep, not to see ladies, study, fast, not sleep. So what is Barone speaking for here? What is Barone's protest? He says, I can't say anything but what my friends have said. I repeat what they said. And I've already sworn that. But there are a few things that I swore to that I kind of am not really into. I really hope that they're not actually written there. Yes, I said them, but I don't really want to follow them. Um, and that is to not talk to a woman for three years, to fast one day a week and only eat every other day, uh, one meal every other day, um, so not to not to eat good food, and to only sleep three hours during the night and not to sleep at all during the day when normally I like to sleep all night and, and nap half the day, um, I really hope those things are not enrolled there. I hope they're not written there. So he's speaking perhaps behalf, on behalf of all of us who say studying is one thing, but why suffer? 
And what follows is a back and forth between the characters where Barone very wittily, very cleverly undermines the king's pretensions to knowledge. And what he's doing, as he says at the end, is that he's speaking for barbarism, which in itself is a paradox, is an oxymoron, because the barbarians were the people that the Greek was, is what the Greeks referred to as those who did not speak Greek, those who had no language from the perspective of the Greeks. So to speak for barbarism is to speak for not speaking, to speak for non-language. But what Barone is doing is pointing out um, the kind of uh, inanity of the king's pretensions and the, we might say, the um, lacking, that the, 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 there's a lack of purpose, a lack of ultimate meaning in pursuing learning for its own sake. It doesn't really do anything. It's kind of sterile and it can be even turned against itself as we'll see what in, in Barone's language. Barone asks, what is the end of study? Let me know. Why, that to know which else we should not know. Things hidden barred, you mean, from common sense? Aye, that is study's godlike recompense. Come on, then. I will swear to study so, to know the thing I am forbid to know. As thus, to study where I well may dine, when I to feast expressly am forbid. Or study where to meet some mistress fine, when mistresses from common sense are hid. Or, having sworn too hard a keeping oath, study to break it, and not break my troth. If study's gain be thus, and this be so, study knows that which yet it doth not know. Swear me to this, and I will ne'er say no. Well, so why do we, why do we go to school? says Barone. What's the point of learning? To learn things that we don't know. Okay, well, if we want to learn things that we don't know, um, I'm going to learn all the things that I don't know. And let's see, you're telling me that I can't eat, so I'm going to learn where I can find good food. And you're going to tell me where I'm, you're going to tell me that I'm not allowed to speak to women, so I'm going to learn where to find women to talk to. And you're going to tell me that, uh, that I've sworn this oath that's too hard to keep. Well, I'm going to study how to find a way to break the oath without really breaking my, tr my troth, breaking my trust, my faith. So he's pointing out study. If you really want to, you know, if you want to go to the extreme of studying things you don't know, it defies the very edicts that you're passing to supposedly support the process of study. Now, in a certain sense, Barone is arguing in bad faith here because he's already determined that he wants to violate these oaths. So he's trying to find a way to do it. But he's, this is part of what the play is all about, is the flexibility, we might say, of things that otherwise, that to normally seem so secure or so true or so solid in their meaning, they're much more flexible. The human mind is capable of twisting ideas and words in ways that they um, that we don't normally, that they weren't intended to be used, we might say. That's, of course, what the poet does, right? But that's what Barone is doing here. He's twisting the king's ideas against them. And as I say, it's in bad faith, but it's also part of what wit does. It's, it's really just violating the unspoken rules and using... Um, using the tools in a way that they weren't intended to be used. Uh, but that's not necessarily wrong. That's not false. It's just unusual. It's just strange. It's just revolutionary in a certain sense. Disruptive, subversive, we might say. And what's the king's answer to Barone's uh, very witty, playful, and again, somewhat um, facetious argument? He says, yeah, but these be the stops that hinder study quite and train our intellects to vain delight, food, women, etc. They are not things that you're saying you're studying those, but really they turn us against study. So what the king is doing is saying, those aren't the subjects that I'm talking about. So this is a very dense and complicated passage, I think. Um, and a lot of Barone's uh, a lot of it is because Barone repeats, and he repeats the same word over and over again, but each time 
with a slightly different meaning. For example, light seeking light doth light of light beguile. He uses the word light four times in one line, and each time it's a slightly different light that he's talking about, we might say. All things that give us pleasure, all of our delights are vain, that is pointless, because all pleasures will ultimately end, just as our lives will end, just as we will die. So, of course, delight is vain in that sense, just as vain and temporary as the delights of women and food. And also, the delights are vain, that is, they are for our own vanity. We seek pleasure for our, for our own sake, not for anyone else. Just as the seeking of women and food is vain, is vanity. So all delights are just as vain as those that the king has condemned. What is more vain, though, what is more pointless, is to suffer by studying, is to, to suffer, to make yourself, uh, to rob yourself of all pleasures, and by doing so, only purchase further suffering, further pain, to study only to do more studying. What's the point of that? All you're doing is purchasing more pain with pain. Scouring a book, painfully pouring upon a book, trying to find some light out of it, but really only being blinded because no light can come from the book. You're falsely blinding yourself with the light from that book or the false light from the book. And you're straining your eyes and you're causing yourself to go blind. Common belief that one could go blind through this kind of uh, 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 studying over book, close reading. So that's a kind of pointless vanity. Light seeking light doth light of light beguile. If you're trying to find light, you're going to lose it. And again, this is complex. This is complicated. Um, I'm not sure I can quite explain or even parse all of the nuances of Barone's language here myself. But he says, so ere you find where light and darkness lies, your light grows dark by losing of your eyes. If you keep staring into darkness, trying to find it, you're not going to find it. You're just going to go blind. So instead, study me how to please the eye indeed by fixing it upon a fairer eye. That is, by looking at a beautiful woman, the eye of a beautiful woman. That is more pleasurable. And then, even though I'll be a bit dazzled, blinded by her beauty, I will follow it. I will follow that light. There's a Neoplatonic image here for those who know about Neoplatonism. This idea of following beauty towards greater light. And then the image of study being like the sun. You can't do too much of it or you'll go blind. You can't stare directly at the sun or else you'll strain your eyes. You have to do it a little bit at a time. Small have continual plodders ever won. The people who keep reading over and over again and plod through. They don't get a lot. All they get, base authority from others' books. So Barone is arguing here, in some sense, for, a, uh, the, again, the sterility of just reading books and studying, being in the library all the time and not out in the real world. And then perhaps in the, the clinching image of this idea of the experience of the world versus the experience of book learning, those people who give the names to the stars those earthly godfathers of heaven's lights, right, who, who proclaim themselves the godfather of the star by giving it a name. That's the, what the godfather, the godfather's traditional role is to give the name to the child. So those who proclaim themselves the godfathers of the stars and name them, well, they don't enjoy the nights any more than those of us who just walk through it and enjoy the beauties of the stars without knowing what each one is called. And anyone can give a name, right? Just giving something a name is not so meaningful. Barone's friends respond, pointing out the irony of being so witty against wit. How well he's read to reason against reading, proceeded well to stop all good proceeding. He weeds the corn and still lets grow the weeding. 
right? He's studied a lot in that he can reason against study. He's done a very good job of speaking, of proceeding, in order to stop us from proceeding, from advancing in our learning. And he's weeding the corn, that is, the, the good uh, wheat, but he's leaving the weeds. And then Barone mocks them by completing their rhyme. The spring is near when green geese are a-breeding, which is just a, like what they've said, a sort of commonplace bit of wisdom. What they've said are all commonplaces about people who do sort of preposterous things, the way Barone has done. And so he follows it up with just another commonplace saying that fits the rhyme. And they don't understand why he said that, and he points out, well, it fits the rhyme. How follows that? Fit in his place in time, in reason nothing, something then in rhyme. So again, the Barone is showing his wit to undermine their pretensions to learning and intelligence and high intellect. Now, of course, Barone eventually concedes and says, well, look, if I have to sign it to stay here with you, I will sign it. But they start reading over the uh, proclamations, and Barone finds the first one, that no woman shall come within a mile of my court on pain of losing her tongue. He finds that to be, as he says, a dangerous law against gentility, rather harsh. And then he reads the second uh, item, the second edict, and notices a problem. Item, if any man be seen to talk with a woman within the term of three years, he shall endure such public shame as the rest of the court can possibly devise. Well, this article, my liege yourself, must break, for well you know, here comes an embassy, the French, king the French king's daughter with yourself to speak, a maid of grace and complete majesty, about surrender up of Aquitaine to her decrepit, sick, and bedrid father. Therefore this article is made in vain, or vainly comes the admired princess hither. What say you, lords, why this was quite forgot? So study evermore is overshot. Well, it does study to have what it would, it doth forget to do the thing it should. And when it hath the thing it hunteth most, tis one as towns with fire, so won, so lost. So Barone points out the irony of pursuing study and immediately to be uh, having to break one's oath, immediately doing the wrong thing. He has to, he's studying so he can be a better king, essentially, uh, but immediately he's forgetting to do his kingly duties, which is talk to the French king's daughter about their, uh, uh, about their agreement. And the king responds to this with, we must of force dispense with this decree. She must lie here on mere necessity. So we have to pause this decree. We have to put it aside for the moment because of necessity. And Barone very wittily points out that necessity will be a very useful excuse. Necessity will make us all forsworn 3,000 times within this three years space. For every man with his affects is born, not by might mastered, but by special grace. If I break faith, this word shall speak for me. I am forsworn on mere necessity. So to, the laws, to, so to the laws at large I write my name, and he that breaks them in the least degree stands in attainder of eternal shame. Suggestions are to other as to me, but I believe, although I seem loath, I am the last that will keep his oath. So he's saying, well, necessity is going to be very useful. Again, everyone has their own affections. Everyone has their own passions. And we're not born with the ability to master them ourselves. It's only grace that gives us the ability to master our passions. This is a standard sort of Christian notion that grace is what uh, helps us to get beyond our sin. Uh, so he says, hey, the good thing is, though, if I break faith, if I am false in my oath, I will, um, uh, I will say it was necessity that did it. Okay, let's just do a quick wrap up of this first video. Um, first, just a list of some of the motifs and images, and these aren't the only ones, but these are just some of the ones that I've picked out as being particularly important. Um, you might have noticed some others as well, but some things that we'll see, some images, concrete images that we'll see repeated throughout the play, the hunt, hunting. Um, the ideas of fame and grace and reputation, um, images of time and death, images of conquest or violence or war in general, 
um, images of light and darkness, obviously, and those are often paired with images of eyes uh, or sight and blindness. Uh, the book, written words, are concrete images and actual props in this in this play. Um, and of course, spoken words, breath and oaths, the oaths that one makes are an important um, image motif that we'll see repeated throughout the play. Some important tropes or themes, that is, ideas that we see returning, movements or, or conflicts that we see, gestures, literary gestures, you might say, narrative gestures. Um, the idea of pursuit and fulfillment or the lack of fulfillment of desire is something that is a very important of this play and one of the structuring principles of the play, the pursuit of what one desires um, and whether one gets it or not. Um, we see a lot of reversal, reversals and subversions in this play. In the first act we've seen, uh, in the first scene, we've seen Barone wittily undermining wit. So those kinds of ironic subversions. Uh, permanence versus impermanence as a concern. Fame as a way to escape the impermanence of life and death, or the permanence of death, we might say. Um, the nature of language and meaning. How language means. How words mean. What sets the limits to the meaning of words and how words are so flexible um, and can be made to mean many different things in many different contexts. And uh, that, of course, takes us to the relationship or the lack of relationship between words and things. What is the relationship between a word and what it's supposed to represent? Um, how do we determine what that relationship is and what happens when that relationship is made uh, questionable or, or uh, rocky or that relationship is strained um, the opposition between things of the spirit and the intellect with things of the body and things of the world that overlaps often with a kind of male versus female masculine versus feminine sort of opposition uh, but that's a, an important conflict and and the the main struggle in the play is perhaps in terms of some of the characters at least between their spiritual and intellectual desires and their worldly desires and finally, the ideas of sterility versus reproduction, both the, the sterility of language and learning for its own sake versus the reproduction, both the literal reproduction of male-female intercourse and other forms of reproducing oneself through one's actions, one's words, etc. And finally, just some questions to consider as you read through the rest of Love's Labor's Lost. Um, what are the different attitudes towards words and language held by the characters? Uh, different characters have different beliefs and, and they show that in the way they use words. Um, so what do you see about, for example, the pedants, Holofernes versus Armado versus Costard and, and Dull, the, uh, the low class characters? What is the difference between they, the way they use their language? and what they think about how what they say relates to what's out there in the real world. Um, and is written language more secure than spoken language? I've made the case that at the beginning of this play, it's at least held up as such, but is written language more secure? Is the meaning in written language more fixed than it is in spoken language? And how can one know the meaning of another's speech? How can you know what someone else is saying? What determine the limits again, of, of uh, the meaning of a word. How do you know the meaning of your own speech? Can you be in control of the meaning of what you say? Or are you in some sense um, subject to the control of the words themselves or how another person chooses to interpret them? So these are just some questions to think about when thinking about how this play engages with the problems of language and meaning within its uh, comedic storyline. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to contact me Contact me um, via text, email, etc., etc. Otherwise, I wish you the day you wish yourselves, and I will see you in class or in the next video.